Good morning, everyone. Sorry to be the one standing between you and your coffee break, but I should actually say a thought out to the organisers for very kindly rearranging my talk so I could give it slightly earlier and still make my flights. So I do hope you enjoy it. Um, so my talk, actually I should introduce myself. I'm Nancy. I work in the gene expression team at the EBI as a functional genomics submissions project lead. So um, basically most of the functional genomics data that comes to us, I at least get to see it. So this is a quick outline of my talk. Just a very quick introduction to EMBL EBI, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about over the course of the conference. And then going into a bit more detail about my team and what we do and some of the resources that we develop. And then um, some of the visualizations that we develop, in particular, what we call an anatomogram. And don't worry, I'll define that. And then how we work with our um, species specific resources and communities particularly the Drosophila melanogaster community with the fly cell atlas, and then just about that collaboration and how we are using that to develop interactive visualizations. <clears throat> so yes, you've probably all seen this slide at some point in one form or another, but this is just a quick overview of EMBL EBI and our resources and where we stand in the genes, uh, genomes and RNA section. So we are in very good company with Ensemble and with the European Nucleotide Archive, among others. So we are the team behind Expression Atlas Knowledge Base and other functional genomics resources, which I will go into now. So we are the functional uh, gene expression team. We're led by Irene Papathiodoro, and we manage and host different resources. So the first side of our resources is the data submission and archival side. So this is where data comes in from the community through our web submission tool that we call Anater, Data that comes in through that tool gets archived in the Array Express collection in BioStudies. So the functional genomic specific section of a wider archive for different data types. And the raw sequencing data then gets handed over to the European Nucleotide Archive for long-term secure storage as part of the INSDC. So the data is spread as widely as possible and is mirrored through all of those. Um, partners. We have then a data analysis section. So we have standardized analysis pipelines for both bulk and for single cell sequencing data. Um, and I just want to mention here that the single cell sequencing data analysis pipeline is hosted in Galaxy and managed by Nextflow. And that is publicly available through the Human Cell Atlas Galaxy instance. So you can use our production workflows, the same ones that we use for single cell atlas, and those, um, sorry, for the single cell expression atlas, and those are freely and publicly available. All of the analysis results from those analysis uh, pipelines then get put into our knowledge bases for expression data, so we have the bulk expression atlas for bulk sequencing data, and the single cell expression atlas, its newest counterpart for single cell expression data and that goes back out to the community, feeding into the data cycle, data life cycle, life cycle rather, and back out to our collaborators to make data as reproducible and as open as we can do. <clears throat> so a little bit more information about the Single Cell Expression Atlas. Our overarching mission is to provide information on what conditions different genes are expressed at the single cell level. We have analysis results for over 10 million cells. This is across over 355 single cell studies and over 20 different species, which includes the human, includes model organisms, and the one that I'm going to focus on, the common fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. As I was practicing this this morning, I realized I forgot at any of my slides to actually put a URL to, my, to this resource. So um, I'm sure you can all Google this. But if you are interested and you want to go to the URL, it's www.ebi.ac.uk forward slash GXA forward slash SC, and you will get to the Single Cell Expression Atlas resource. And our latest release was in March 2023. So we are committed to increasing and adding data to this resource as often as we can. Okay, 
So basically, what can I do with Single Cell Expression Atlas? So this is just a slide. It's a little bit busy, but it puts together a number of different features that we have developed. So we have the cell type search wheel, which allows you to say which investigates experiment, um, sorry, which experiments investigate my cell type of interest. Once I have found a cell type of interest or a gene of interest, how does that cluster in the corresponding cells? So I can look at um, cell clustering using dimensionality reduction plots. I can overlay that with metadata and I can look at the corresponding gene expression heat map. And then I can look at what genes do my cell type of interest express. Does my gene of interest ex uh, co-express in a particular cell type, for instance? Things like that. And lastly, with some data sets, we develop these anatomograms which allow users to answer where does my cell type, where is it located in the body? Um, so a little bit more detail on an anatomogram and to define it. These are interactive single cell level visualizations of cell types in situ, as it were, so within the tissue of that organism. And this allows users to investigate what other cell types does my gene of, uh, sorry, does my cell of interest interact or reside with? And can this help me understand why I see a particular function and why do I see a particular phenotype if genes which are um, integral to that cell type function get perturbed or as a result of disease? So I, a little bit more, oh, sorry, a little bit more information. You can go, so these are all single cells. And then when you hover over, you get your little cell type label. So they, they, do, um, they do interact with the user. Uh, this is an overview. <laughs> this is an overview of the current state of the Human Anatomograms Project, which has been developed in collaboration with the Human Cell Atlas Project. These are, as I said, interactive single cell level images for adult human tissues, adult human normal tissues, I should specify. And we have these for the uh, placenta, for the liver, for the lung and the pancreas shown here, as well as a few more live on our website. So in order to get to an anat anatomogram, you find your data set of interest. For example, if you're looking at the placenta data set or a placenta data set, I should say, in the results section, you will find a little side note that says anatomograms you can click on that, you can click through those images down to the single cell level, so from the top to the single cell level, and when you select a cell type within that anatomogram, you will also find popping up alongside it a cell type level heat map which shows the top five genes for your cell type. Okay. So this is our next steps, our aim for the Drosophila melanogaster community in collaboration with the Fly Cell Atlas. So we want to develop these for the fly, for the fly organism part. So currently, we are actively developing the anatomograms for the ovary and for the testes. But of course, there are many other organism parts. For example, the mouth, I'm going to mispronounce this, Malphigian tubules and the gut as part of the ne sorry, next steps for this, for this collaboration. So let's go into this in more detail. I'm sure you've all heard over the course of this conference, the Fly Cell Atlas data set, but we want to go into this in more detail. So we find this publication, Fly Cell Atlas, we go to the data availability statement and we find the records for the raw data archived for the Fly Cell Atlas data. And we click on that and we find the sample level metadata and we extrapolate that and we get the cell level metadata. So what do we do with this cell level metadata? is we map it to species-specific ontologies, so in this case, FBBT. So for every term that we find in this level metadata, we map it to the corresponding species-specific ontology. So here we map testes to testes in the FBT ontology, and then down to the single cell level, we have this spermatocyte term, and we map it to the corresponding term, and we maintain the hierarchy which is defined in the ontology. And we do that for every single cell type term where we can find a corresponding uh, accurate record for that term. 
And we use the OLS service in order to find these terms. And we also contact our handy, handy collaborators. I'll go into that in more detail. So the next step for that is if you want an interactive image, you need someone to make that image. I became a scientist because I am rubbish at art. So what we do is we find a, a really nice, talented artist. So that's Taryn Porter, who works at the Sanger. She's a scientific illustrator. And so we asked her, can you make us some beautiful images for this organism part? And she did that for us. So we have some really nice images for the testes. So we have a top level image here and a zoom in what we call, which is that organism part at the single cell level. And then for every shape within that um, image, we develop a shape. And that's her, that's her part of the collaboration. And then what we do is we get our species specific collaborator from that community, in this case, Damien, who is sitting in the audience. We've been working together really closely as part of the fly-based um, um, fly resource. So we work together and we assign every shape within the image with the corresponding ontology term. So as you can see, as you go through the shapes, every single shape gets its corresponding ontology term and that is mapped to the cell type label as well as the cell type ID. And of course, we maintain the hierarchy which is defined in the ontology. So we have these top level terms, child term, child term, child term, and that is all preserved. So then we do that for every shape within these images. So this is the top level overview of the Drosophila male reproductive system. And then we define the shapes within it. Of course, we then an annotate it. And then we do it for the single cell level. So for every single shape and for every single layer within that shape, so if you have cells residing in a subcellular, uh, a sub part of that organism, then that also gets labeled. And we do that for every single shape in these images. Yeah. So, what do we do with all of that data that we've just painstakingly annotated? We put it back into the data cycle. So this is all of the resources. So let's go through. The data comes from the publication. We go to the data set corresponding to that publication. We find the raw data, which is linked to every sample, and we run those raw data through our analysis pipeline. And we feed it into the knowledge base. That could be the end, but no. With the knowledge base, with the analyzed results, we can start again, and we can push that data forward. So what we do is we have our cell type wheel, which shows us a metadata search for the, um, cell data, for the data for that cell type. So you have your cell type, you run it through, you get this beautiful visualization which shows you all of the cell types associated with that organism part within that species. You click on a section of the wheel and it shows you a little heat map for the top five genes for that cell type across all of the data sets where that cell type has been investigated. You get your experiment level result with dimensionality reduction plots overlaid with that metadata, so that inferred cell type metadata where we have it, or other sample level metadata. So you can see how does my cell type cluster with other cell types, and you have the corresponding gene expression heat map. I haven't shown it here, but it's beside, the, um, beside, the, um, beside these clusters. And then you have your anatomogram, which helps you answer where is my cell type located in the body. And then you have the heat map, which shows me what genes are expressed in my cell type alongside all of the other cell types within that organism part. I like to say we've been doing this in collaboration with Flybase. It's been really fun, actually. We really enjoyed ourselves. So this is our collaborator within Flybase, Damien. And um, the Flybase collaborators have been really instrumental in helping us discover data sets which are important and of high value, value to the community that we are trying to help, or trying to work with rather. So we get the data sets, they help with the validation of the cell type annotations, and they provide data summarizations. So this is an example of the data summary provided for the, single, uh, for the fly cell atlas. So this is a type of experiment tissues of interest, et cetera, and links out to the data source, both the expression atlas side and the data archive. 
And what they also do is they generate cell type specific reports, so the level of gene expression across different cell types in the tissue and the gene expression visualization by cell type. So we feed back into, we've, they take the data that we produce from them and feed it back into the resources. So it all goes around in a big circle and everybody benefits. So lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge the team behind the gene expression team and our collaborators. So Ling Young Zhao is our web developer who is involved in um, implementing these on the web production side. I'm part of the biocuration team. Pedro is our bioinformatician. And then we have our Fly Cell Atlas collaborators, particularly Damien, particularly Taryn. I know David Assumi Sutherland is sitting in the back, um, and he's been wandering around talking to people, and Norbert, who leads the Fly Cell Atlas collaboration. Jana Eliasova is the Human Anatomograms illustrator. And if you want to find us, you can find us at Array Express EBI or at Expression Atlas. And if you want to talk to us, you can email us through geneexpression at eba.ac.uk. And lastly, a quick shout out and thank you to all of our funders. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Nancy. Very nice talk. This question? Hi, hi, thanks. Yeah, but very nice. Um, as you know, the Cellosaurus cella uh, of, of cell lines has a few fly lines in it. Uh, can we get equivalents? You wouldn't even need single cell data. Can you get the, the same type of expression data from those cell lines? Yeah, so we take data from lots of public archives, not just Array Express. So anything that is publicly available and meets our criteria, which you can find at the Single Cell Expression Atlas FAQs, um, we ingest that data, we run it through that standardized pipeline, and then we visualize it where we can get it. So if there is publicly available fly cell line data that the community has produced and that we can analyze, then we would take it. OK, um, my question here. Here. Nancy. Sorry. I'm <laughs> Ceci, here. Oh, yeah, hi. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really bad with visualizing things. Uh, so my question uh, is different. I, first of all, I love illustrations. Don't get me wrong. But I just, just wonder if you explore AI for creating the illustrations, uh, because you could either feed the images or, or you can, you know, explore if it works to scale up. I don't know. That's something we are thinking about. So single cell level images are quite complicated because we also maintain that hierarchy, as I showed. Um, so because it's quite difficult for um, the same cell type shape to be the same across multiple images, that would then need to be taught to say, when I see that cell type shape, it should be annotated with that ontology annotation. That ontology annotation for example, for the fly cell atlas, is ontology specific, maybe less so for human because there's more image data out there. Um, so it depends how much we can teach the AI and then generate those images. But it is, I think when I was looking for reference images, it's particularly we also use scientific images to get a realistic idea of what these cell type shapes and cell types, uh, cell structures look like, um, it, it does depend on what's out there in order to train and to get a sort of comprehensive, comprehensive image that we could then automatically annotate to the cell type level, to the single cell level. But I for the, absolutely. Yes, I have a point to bring up about heterogeneity, cell to sell heterogeneity for content with mm -hmm. respect to a given cell type. How do you handle that? So this is why we have these dimensionality reduction plots next to blah, 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 blah. Oh, this is quite going quite far back. Ah. Yeah, OK. This is why we have the dimensionality reduction plots next to the gene expression heat map, so that you can look at the cell by cell variability so not all the same cells which are overlaid with the cell type metadata or indeed clustered together will have exactly the same um, expression level. 
So you can see the cell type heterogeneity at the single cell level, less so in the heat map because what we are doing is getting averages across all of the cell types overlaid with that inferred cell type annotation. So we are averaging here, but at the single cell level in the dimensionality reduction plots, that's certainly possible. Could you give us an example of what parameters you record when you say cell to cell variability in heat map? What are the parameters that you, you're handling? Um, so all of the cell level gene expression, so these are massive tables essentially. So what you have is your cell identifier and your gene identifier. And so for every cell, you have the expression level of that gene. So those matrices, those analysis results are available for every data set. So you can explore that because we have that cell level metadata. And because each cell has a unique identifier, you can map that back to the cell level metadata, back to the gene expression data. So you can explore that using those analysis results, and those are all available to the community. In terms of parameters, we have, like, depending on whether we're capturing triumphal level metadata or cell type level metadata, then we have different parameters. We try and make those parameters explained in our FAQs, downloadable in our archives, and downloadable in the process data that we present in the knowledge bases. So we, we do try to, to give you everything you need in order to make as much information as you want. Some stage, yeah, at some stage, we must talk about glycosylation heterogeneity, which is enormous. I'm quite thankful to be working on genes sometimes, because we get transcripts, but we don't get all of these little fiddly post-translational modifications. So I'm like, I think I get an easy path in life with genes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so thank you again, Nancy. Thank you very much. <laughs>